Hello, everybody. Welcome to part 7B of the Magdalene Manuscript. If you missed part 7A, I will put a link to that part down in the description box below. Now I have to apologize. It is extremely hot here in Atlanta, Georgia right now. So I do have the air conditioning going right now. I hope it's not too loud or not picking up too much through the microphone system. It is just excruciatingly hot right now. And after this is done, I actually have to go out and be social. So I want to make sure that I'm not a hot, sweaty mess by the time I'm done with this. Again, my apologies if the sound is coming through the microphone. Okay, so we're going to be starting with this section of operational reality. Last week, again, in part 7a, we started with Egyptian alchemy and quantum physics. It's really simply a matter of what world we are identifying with and what behaviors best operate in that world. You have learned, no doubt, how to operate in the everyday world of the Newtonian reality. You know that if you drop something, it will continue to the floor. You know how to pick this book up and turn the pages. When you are done, you know how to put the book down again. These are learned neuromuscular behaviors. You did not know how to do this when you were six months old, but now you do. You have learned this skill over the course of interacting with everyday world of Newtonian bound things. So again, otherwise, the laws of property or nature, which we spoke about last week. I suggest you think of the internal alchemies, including the Egyptian system, as simply a means to operate in another reality, namely the quantum. Just as you learned how to pick up a book and put it down, you can learn how to do things in the quantum world as well. You just need a reliable teaching method. And internal alchemical systems are just that, teaching methods. Alchemical mastery brings with it an amazing array of non-ordinary abilities or powers of consciousness, which are called siddhis in yoga. These abilities may seem very strange to Western minds as weird as the quantum world from which they are derived, but they are simply the natural expression of an evolving consciousness. Yes, and I have mentioned the Siddhis before. The Siddhis are spoken about in the third and fourth pada of the Yoga Sutras. Now I'm going to say something. I believe I've mentioned this before. I probably have on the Dark Outpost, but I feel like it would be irresponsible of me not to bring this up. Now, he is probably going to be talking about, obviously, some of the cities and what they are, how they work with the quantum realm of reality. But in the yoga world, the cities are considered to be potentially very, very dangerous. And what I mean by this is that these are what we call yogic powers. So these would include the abilities to levitate. This would include the ability to astro travel. This would include the ability to make things multiply like food. As I've said, there are many, many books out there, autobiographies and biographies of gurus in India who were witnessed doing these things. Now, the reason why in the yoga disciplines, these are considered extremely dangerous is because if learned by the wrong people, if put into the wrong hands, these siddhis can cause havoc. And we have seen this in our world with the um, controllers of the world. I believe that they know how to use these siddhis and they use them to harm other people. In a traditional yoga lineage, you will only study the first and second pada of the yoga sutras for about the first 10 years as a student. And then only after the 10 year mark will a teacher maybe take you into the third and fourth pada. If you are someone with a pure intention, if you have had your ego death, if you are coming from a pure state of being, then these siddhis can be very beneficial to humanity. All right. So it's all again about the conduit. And in the first 10 years of practice, usually people are going through their ego death. But right before the ego dies, it usually gets really ferocious. And so if someone were, were to learn how to do a siddhi with a ferocious ego, it could cause major destruction. So I just want to put that out there. We have to respect um, the gravity of what they're talking about with these siddhis and understand that this is not for the faint of heart. All right, siddhis and the power of consciousness. The siddhis or powers of consciousness naturally unfold as one progresses along a path of spiritual development. 
they are there are many well documented cases of buddhist christians islamic jewish and Taoist saints and mystics who had attained these states absolutely there are in addition, it is well known among indigenous cultures that shamans often exhibited such powers as well. I have personally made a study of the cities for the last few decades. To the Western materialistic consciousness, some of these powers seem outlandish, but they have been well documented in numerous cultures. Several years ago, I had an experience with a city of a mystic in one of the most unlikely places on earth, Kodak, Alaska. I had been invited to teach a workshop in Anchorage, and the following weekend, I taught a workshop on Kodak Island. After the final session on the island, I had a few days off. My organizer gave me a few options, and I chose the boat ride to a small island inhabited by the Russian Orthodox monks, where an Orthodox saint had lived. I was told that visitors, more often than not, had to turn back due to the rough seas. In fact, I was told the prelate of the church in charge of the monasteries had never been able to see it as every time they went for a visit, high seas forced them back. This was a source of immense humor among the native people. We took a small airplane ride to a nearby island and landed on a spit of land that ended abruptly into the turbulent and frigid waters. We were greeted by a local fisherman's wife driving a pickup truck and I hopped in the back. My organizer got in front. It was summer but there was light snowfall as we headed for her house by the sea. I remember feeling quite cold and wondering how in the hell people survived here in the winter. We pulled up to a small house surrounded by cedar trees and went inside. Sitting by a large wooden table, we sipped tea. Now anyone who has been to northern Alaska knows that time is a strange bird in these parts. We just sat and sat, talked a little here and there, waiting it seemed for some opportune time to leave. Finally, our host announced that it was time to go, and we filed back into the pickup and headed to the dock where her husband was waiting with a fishing thrawler. We took off across an amazingly placid sea. Our host sat next to a boom, knitting and commenting on how unusual it was to have such a calm passing. I sat looking out at the rich, unbelievably beautiful landscape of the neighboring islands as our boat chugged along at a fairly crisp space. Seals followed us partway. Passing an outcrop of boulders, we came into a small natural harbor. The water was too shallow for the travelers, so we got into a dinghy and headed to shore. The scene was like something out of the Middle Ages. A group of men were on the beach burning brush, the air thick with billows of white smoke, which swirled in eddies against the stark blue sky. The monks wore long beards, typical of Russian and Greek Orthodox cler clerics. And they were wearing long gray robes with thin robes tied about the waist. Each one of them also wore a crucifix. Stepping out of the boat onto the sand, we were greeted by someone who appeared to be in his early 30s and had an air of authority about him. Our host explained that I had come from Washington State to visit. The abbot smiled approvingly and proceeded to take us on a tour of the small monastery, which consisted of perhaps a dozen men or so. As we headed up a path into the shade of cedars, he noted that the monastery did not often get the host of pilgrims. He took us to several spots, including the small hut where the saint had lived. I recall the air being musty from the old manuscripts and icons that had been in the saint's possessions. But there was also an unmistakable sense of serenity. The abbot also took us to a sacred spring reputed to have healing powers. Finally, he took us to the small chapel where the saint had been previously buried. His body had since been removed, but the site was still considered holy. The abbot caught me staring at the corner of the chapel. He asked me what I was seeing. I said I was seeing a column of white light coming out of the floor and going up through the roof. The abbot seemed to smile a bit and said that the saint had been buried in the corner of the church. Then he said something in a somewhat dreamy voice as if he were partway into another world. I remember his words because they sounded so odd to me at the time. Would that we were all so sensitive. Seeming to rouse himself from his reveries, the abbot said, there is one more thing I would like to show you. He guided us back down the hill to a very small chapel that had obviously just recently been built. It was quite unusual in that it was perhaps nine feet square and some 20 feet tall. The inside of the building glowed from the gold pigments of recently painted icons. They depicted the lives of saints along with other prominent figures of the Russian Orthodox Church. 
In the back of the tiny chapel, there was a very small altar with a Bible in Russian. The abbot pointed out the various icons and their meanings, and then he said that the tour had come to an end. He motioned us out of the chapel and closed the door behind us. I remember suddenly having a question about mysticism I thought the abbot might be able to clarify. I knocked at the door, but there was no answer. I knocked again. Still, no sign of anyone inside. Gingerly, I opened the door to find the chapel completely empty. For a moment, I stood in shock. Then my ever skeptical mind came in and began to search for trap doors or other entrances. I even picked up the small frayed rug on the corner to see if there was a secret exit. Nothing. Still in kind of a shock, I wandered out the door and out to the beach where our party was waiting. There, clearly in view, was the abbot. He was talking to my host as I was stepped up. He nodded his head with a distinct twinkle in his eyes. We boarded the, the dinghy and headed back to the thrawler. The sun was low in the sky, and I stood at the deck looking over the stern as we headed back to the sea. I was very quiet. As I write these words, I find myself caught up in the feelings of awe in what that in wonder that I felt then. I had known that Sidhis existed and studied the physics of them and had made it a hobby of mine to collect stories and documentation. But here on the small island off of Kodak, a humble contemplative had shown me the mystery of the yogic powers firsthand. Halfway through the ride back, the fisherman's wife turned from her knitting. You know, they do things like that all the time. Things like what, I asked. You know, teleporting, bilocating, things like that. Really, I said. Yes, she replied, not taking her eyes off of her knitting. The island is a remote place. There is no mail service. We see them sometimes in town picking up their mail and buying things. And she said with the most conspirator tone, they don't have any way of getting there. The powers of consciousness or cities range from what are called the lesser cities to what are termed as the greater cities. The lesser cities include such psychic abilities as clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, and clairgnosis, as in the knowing something but not knowing how you know it. The first three powers, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, are refinements of the physical senses. As psychic powers unfold, they are often first present themselves in one of these three forms or in combination. Thus, one might begin to see images in the mind that can't be physically seen. In other words, mental visual impressions. In scientific studies involving remote viewing, the city is often used. Studies show that some people can, under the right conditions, accurately report visual impressions of objects or locations hundreds of miles away without any previous knowledge of them. The reception of such visual information must presumably come from some other source than that of physical sight, since the viewers were nowhere near the location they described. Many yogis, saints, and mystics have reported that they could see their disciplines in distant locations when it was called for. In one account, the yogi Neem Kroli Baba suddenly asked for large amounts of food to be brought to him. So Neem Kroli Baba is um, one of the uh, gurus of India that I know had was able to do Siddhis. If you read any of Ram Das or Bhagavan Das's autobiographies, um, they talk a lot about witnessing Neem Kroli Baba do things like um, astro travel, uh, teleport. Uh, there's a story, I think it's with Bhagavan Das, where he was driving Neem Kroli Baba through India and they were chit chatting and he looked over and Neem Kroli Baba was gone out of the passenger seat. And then a few minutes later, he reappeared again. There's another story where Neem Kroli Baba makes, multiplies apples for people, like kind of like what Yahshua did in, in the sermon where he multiplied the grapes and the, the bread, not the fish, the grapes and the bread for the people. These are Siddhis. So let me read that again. In one account, the yogi Neem Kroli, Kroli Baba suddenly asked for large amounts of food to be brought to him. Those present report that he consumed a mind-boggling amount of food before going into samadhi, a form of deep yogic trance. When the yogi came out of meditation, his disciples asked him what had happened. He reported that he had suddenly seen one of his disciples dying in the desert. The last desire of a dying man was to eat. Baba said the disciple had reached a level of attainment where there was no further need to reincarnate. But with the desire for food on his mind at the moment of death, he would have been brought back into the wheel of reincarnation just through the power of his one unfulfilled desire. Baba had taken upon himself the task of fulfilling the man's last wish for food and using his yogic powers, he transmuted the desire. When psychic information is received auditorily, the person is called a clairaudient. I'm a clairaudient.
I hear Magdalene speaking to me all the time. Such persons have subtle impressions of hearing sounds and or voices. The inner realms of consciousness are filled with sound and music that can be incredibly beautiful. It has been suggested by some that many of the great composers actually heard the music of these realms in the music of the spheres greatly influence their composition. Some individuals feel things at a very subtle level. These persons are called clairsentients. There is often a fine line between a clairsentient and an empath. Empaths have highly developed sensitivities and often feel other person's feelings, especially those immediately around them. Clairsentients may also be empathic, but in addition, they receive psychic impressions in the form of subtle physical sensations. Clairnosis is one of the more fascinating cities. When you have a hunch about something but have no idea how you might know such a thing, this is clairnosis. That is your hunch turns out to be true. If it turns out to be false, we call that delusion. Some have suggested that clairnosis is an attribute of pure, pure consciousness, which is by nature omniscient and omnipresent. As one rises up the ladder of consciousness, one's own personal awareness takes on some of these qualities of pure consciousness, and episodes of clairnosis increase. The lesser cities also include such things as healing abilities and limited powers of prophecy. This class of yogic powers also includes the ability for awareness to become very small or very large. In other words, not confined by the limitations of the body. The greater siddhis include such things as levitation, in which the body floats or hovers in the air. Again, this city is not confined to Indian yogis, as some believe. There are well-documented sightings of St. Francis of Assisi, or one hovering in the air. St. Francis exhibited other siddhis as well. In fact, his physical remains still have spiritual powers even after his death. While visiting his shrine in Assisi, I transported into a spiritual realm through the emanation of his crypt. I heard a sound like a wind blowing through the aspen trees when I stood near his body. And when I returned to my hotel room, my skin was red as if I had a light sunburn. By the way, if you are ever at a CC, here's a little tip. As you enter the main entrance into the basilica where St. Francis's remains are kept, turn to your left. Off to both sides, there are stairs that lead down to the crypt and it is certainly worth visiting. The problem is that there are actual throngs of people milling about, and it is difficult to find a quiet space. If you proceed further past the stairs, you will see a large altar in the distance, the only one in this part of the church. On the floor, in front of the altar, there is a geometric figure. It sits directly above St. Francis' tomb, and the emanations from his area are very strong. No one seems to know about it, so you can stand directly on the spot and receive the emanations in relative peace. The greater cities also include such remarkable abilities such as teleportation, like the abbot I mentioned early, and bilocation being two places at once. There are other abilities that fall under this category as well, but the purpose of this chapter is not to discuss the cities in depth. It is important to realize that cities or yogic powers are attained as a natural consequence of spiritual development. There is, however, a very real danger with the cities. They have a glamour and a seduction for many people. The advice often given is to avoid the pursuit of yogic powers. And when they do arise, to not pay much attention to them. So again, that's going back to what I just said. In the lineage, traditional lineage of yoga, it is understood that siddhis are not inherently bad. Again, it comes down to the conduit. And with great power comes great responsibility. So for people who were ever able to teleport or astro travel or do these things, they have to themselves have some sort of an ego death before that happens. We talk a lot about the power of consent. If someone can astro travel and they're curious about someone else, they want to spy on them and they use their cities to break the laws of free will to be in that person's space to watch them. That's considered a form of stalking. That's not somebody giving consent. But if you're someone who has had the ego death and you understand your own humility and you understand that everything you do should be done for the greatest good of humanity, you will not invade the laws of free will and consent with your own powers. Instead, you will use them appropriately for everyone's highest good. A short story about the dilemma of Siddhis will help make this clear. This concerns a living yogi who is quite well known, so I will avoid using his name. And although he teaches kundalini yoga, there are very strong parallels to this system of Egyptian alchemy. 
So as someone who is a professional, very well, high level of education in yoga, I'm going to tell you guys to avoid Kundalini yoga at all costs. The actual practice of Kundalini yoga. I've spoken about this before. Kundalini is an all yoga. Okay. It's not a specific form of yoga. It is an all yoga. It's an Ashtanga yoga. It's an Iyengar yoga. It's in Sivananda yoga. It is just a practice of your Christ consciousness arising. Um, the man who created Kundalini yoga, he's not alive anymore, but right before he died, he was in so much legal trouble. He's a, he was a Scott, he was a, a scam artist. Okay. He was a scam artist and he plays big on, um, spiritual manipulation. So we have these pranayamic breath exercises that we do in our practices. And he would create these breathing exercises that would cause people to hyperventilate. And he would sell that hyperventilation as a spiritual awakening. It wasn't a spiritual awakening. It was hyperventilation. He also was somebody that would basically proclaim that if you're spiritually successful, then you're going to be abundant in your life. You're going to be super wealthy. It's not true. It's not true. Right. So I would just really avoid Kundalini yoga in my personal opinion. It's, it's not do your own research over it. A Yogi Bhajan was the name of the man who created it. Um, there's a lot of just, I could probably do a four hour video just on how much of a scam it is, but there's documentaries already out there about Yogi Bhajan and how much of a scam artist he was. So um, he was not interested in actually helping people understand how to heal themselves. He was scamming people. Okay. All right. He's quite a powerful being and I had a wonderful experience. Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, I respect this guy's channeling, but yeah, this He's talking about him being, no, he was a scam artist. 100% was a scam artist. According to the close disciple of his, who I came to know, the yogi had gone to India for a spiritual treat in his early 20s after having attained some of the siddhis. He was resting against a tree, listening to the beautiful music of a master mu musician who was caught up in the fever of bhakti, divine love. And due to the intensity of devotion within the music, our yogi was transported into a deep state of samadhi and experienced great ec ecstasies and bliss. Again, probably hyperventilation. The concert ended abruptly and when it started to rain and the musician rushed indoors. indoors. Using his Siddic powers, the yogi caused the rain to stop and the music returned to his kirtans. <sighs> Kirtan is another thing too, guys. Kirtan is never supposed to be a form of devotion, okay? It was never meant to be a form of devotion, these kirtan bands. Kirtan started in ashrams. When you go and stay in an ashram, you're living a very disciplined life. And so once a week, the people of the ashram got to like party a little bit, let their hair down, but they couldn't like listen to like the Rolling Stones or like Led Zeppelin, right? So they had to make the, the party in line with the ashram. That's how Kirtan started. I myself cannot stand Kirtan. Um, it's not a devotional practice. It's just not. It's not. Okay. All right. Very quickly, our yogi was transported back into Samadhi, but his bliss was rudely ended by an old man kicking him in the side. The man was also a yogi and the fear he continued to kick the younger yogi yelling obscenities at him. What are you doing? He asked. Don't you realize that this area has been suffering from a drought and you have stopped the rains for your own selfish desires? The ancient yogi raised his staff in the air and pointed out his younger peer. Mark my words. If you don't stop this, you will pay a great karmic debt. You will spend, spend thousands of lifetimes as a sea creature. The old yogi then kicked some of the dust in the direction of the young man and left him before he could respond. Absolutely. So using your siddhis for your own selfish to serve yourself is exactly like black magic. Exactly. So that is why it can be dangerous. All right. And black magic, again, is going against nature for your own service to self, trying to interrupt other people's paths for your own service to self. It's never going to end, end up in your favor. Immediately, the younger yogi went into meditation and through his Siddic powers returned the reins. He prevalently prayed to God to take away his Siddhis and miraculously they left him. But over the years, they slowly returned to a much wiser, less flamboyant man. I believe that the Siddhis are a natural expression of evolution. They are perhaps one of our next evolutionary benchmarks. And anyone practicing internal alchemy long enough will eventually have to contend with them. The Siddhis are to us like apples are to apple trees. Apples are intrinsic to the nature of the apple tree, but it's only when the apple tree reaches a certain stage of development that the fruit appears. Until then, they are only a potential. 
When an individual human consciousness reaches a certain stage of development, the Siddhi spontaneously appear. Every alchemical lineage deals with the non-ordinary powers that are attained as a result of spiritual practice. And every alchemical tra tradition has its own method for developing and handling these spiritual powers. In the Egyptian system, these powers were developed as a byproduct of strengthening the etheric double or ka. Another thing that Kundalini Yoga did that was super scammy and gross. So back in um, 2011, uh, November 11th of 2011, so 11, 11, 11, um, this Kundal Kundalini group decided to take this like mystical journey to India for some mystical powers of this mystical date of the 11s. And they scammed people. So any person with common sense knows that our dates are man-made and therefore dates are not um, powerful for their actual dates. They're only powerful for the astrological planetary motion of the particular day because our calendar is only for us. It's not, it's not real. And it pissed a lot of people off in the yoga world because they were scamming people. They were using spiritual manipulation. Just please stay away from Kundalini yoga. Do your research. Yogi Bhajan was a con man. Do not fall for that shit. It's spiritual manipulation. If you want real yoga, go to a shala in India that works through the real yoga lineage. Kundalini, uh, Kundalini is in all forms of yoga. Doesn't matter if you're practicing Patanjali system, tantric system. Doesn't matter if you're an Ashtanga, Iyengar, Sivananda. Doesn't matter. There's Kundalini there. It's always there. You don't have to do the specific form of yoga to find the Kundalini. The Kundalini is just the rising of your Christ conscious through your Shashumna through your most important nadi up your spine. So please just don't get scammed. I don't want people scammed, okay? Just do your research. Don't get scammed. All right, strengthening the ka. So let us return to the ka for it holds such a prominent place in Egyptian alchemy. Unlike the kat, the dense physical body, the ka body can seemingly walk through walls, float in air, and cover vast distances in a moment. In yogic literature, there are many reliable accounts of saints and mystics by locating being in two places at once. One explanation often gives for this phenomenon has to do with the Ka body. When the Ka is sufficiently charged, it can have a kind of density that can be seen by others. Because the Ka is the etheric double of the person, it looks exactly like him or her. In the manuscript, Magdalene talks about Yahshua appearing to her after the crucifixion before his ascent into the heavens. Or spirit. And again, I don't believe he was actually ever crucified. I think that was confirmation bias in his channeling. This was from the perspective of Egyptian alchemy, a form of Ka, highly charged as a result of the alchemical practices they had engaged in. According to the manuscript, Magdalene had been assisting Yahshua in one of the primary tasks of Egyptian alchemy, to charge his Ka body with an increase of energy. Anyone wishing to experience the fruits of the Egyptian alchemical system must engage in power building practices for the Ka. There are many methods used to accomplish this, but it is not in the scope of this chapter to discuss them. A couple of methods are discussed by Magdalene in the manuscript itself, and I often refer the reader to them. Note the method of drawing in the solar energy I described in the first chapter is one example of a very simple energy building practice. By whatever methods used, as the Ka acclimates more energy, its magnetics become stronger. The use of these magnetic fields for the elevation of consciousness was one of the great discoveries of Egyptian alchemy. While strengthening the Ka is a fundamental focus in the system of alchemy, it is only the first task. The second task is to successfully shift identification from the Kat, the dense physical body, to the Ka, shifting, if you will, identification from the New Newtonian world into the quantum. In identifying with the Ka, the practitioner does not disregard the physical body, but in the practice of, of alchemical meditation, one's identity is shifted from the physical to the luminous body or the Ka. This shifting of attention and glowing awareness of the Ka has an autonomous body usually takes place in, with, within a spiritual context. This is crucial. Since without a mental understanding regarding the Ka, it is unlikely that one would be able to utilize ex extraordinary abilities. The shifting of identification. When I teach the shifting of identification in workshops, I use many different methods. Some of them involve movement and some of them involve inner attention. 
After an unusually long training session at an Egyptian alchemical retreat a few years ago, someone shared his startling experience. He had just finished the last inner practice and had opened his eyes. He felt someone beside him, though no one had been there when he started. He turned to his right to see himself looking back at himself smiling. He literally jumped out of his seat. This exercise in the workshop had managed to energize his ka to such an extent that he could see his own subtle for form with open eyes. Ram Dass talks about that a lot in his books too. But sometimes a person can process a strong ka body even if he or she has not practiced alchemy. A modern experience with the ka. I had an unusual experience with a client's ka several years ago. At that time, I was a practicing psychotherapist and was referring and was referred a man in his late 20s suffering from depression. In the course of our therapy together, it became clear that he had suffered extreme physical and sexual abuse as a child. I had always had a strange impression whenever we met. Although he was deeply depressed, he seemed to emanate a very intense energy, as, as if somewhere behind those electric blue eyes, there was an inferno of unbelievable power. Now, I always make it a policy with potential... Um, I can't say this word on YouTube, but removing yourself from your life starts with an S, risk to enter into a contract. They must agree to contact me physically or at least by phone if they plan to take their own self off the, the earth, we'll say. And I agree not to talk them out of it, but to make sure that it is really what they want to do. In the course of trying to get me and actually speak, they usually come to their senses and the crisis is averted. In this case of this man, I had to leave town for, for a professional seminar about six weeks into our work together. I gave him the phone number in Washington, D.C., where I would be staying. Now, here is where it gets really weird. The seminar just moved into the section on death and dying when an attendant handed the speaker a piece of paper. She asked if Tom Kenyon was present. I raised my hand and was given a piece of paper with a name and phone number. It simply identified the person as the sister of my client. I went to the nearby payphone and called the number. She answered and informed me that her brother, my client, had committed the removal of himself. I was extremely grieved and pissed. He had violated our contract agreement, which had put, been put in place to be a safety net. Had he contacted me, I could have gotten him to see that he really did not want to take his own life. But he had taken the coward's way out. He removed himself while I was out of town. I steamed about this for several days. Then one night I had a strange dream in which he came to me and asked for my forgiveness. In the dream, I forgave him and we, he went on his way. Now it gets very, very strange. My office happened to be next to my house and I usually saw clients in the afternoons and evenings, never in the morning. That day after the strange dream, I was in town and was approached by an acquaintance. He said that he was thinking about seeing me. I asked him why, since he didn't ha seem to have the type of interest in personal growth. He told me he had driven by my office at around 5 a.m. that morning and had seen a very sad looking person going inside. Mind you, I wasn't even awake at 5 a.m., much less seeing anyone. He said he came back around the house about a half an hour later and saw the same person coming out with a smile on his face and skipping down the block. I asked him to describe this mysterious person and he, his description matched my client perfectly. I was stunned. I had not yet stumbled upon Egyptian alchemy and this idea regarding the cod body. And so I had no way of explaining this to myself for several years. All right. I'm going to stop it there because that just seems like a, a ghost or, or what we call a ghost, a spirit. And they can come back. I mean, I think all of us, most of us have probably had experiences with loved ones that have passed on coming back and visiting us in their spiritual body, their cod body. They look like themselves, right? So anyway, guys, um, I have still, I do still have the comments disabled due to the unbelievable harassment from the Christians who seem to be the most violent of everyone. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, you know, I remember my growing up in church and my youth pastor being like, show people that you've got what they don't. Yeah, no, the Christians are showing people that they have a very, a lot of, they have to have a lot of self-hatred to be that violent against somebody. And so I do pray and hope that they see the light and see that their religion is nothing but a form of satanic Luciferian rituals, right? That the true God is way better than the one they've been sold. So anyway, guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon.